Tonight is part of a series of programs around the exhibition Howardina Pindell, What Remains to be Seen. What Remains to be Seen is the first major museum survey for this groundbreaking multidisciplinary artist and presents a wide range of work from the 1960s to today. Tonight, exhibition curator Naomi Beckwith and Hamza Walker, curator and director of LAX Art, will consider the year 1979. The year was a radical one in social and political history, as well as for the life of Howardina Pindell. Although he probably needs no introduction here in Chicago, before taking his position as director of LAX Art, a nonprofit arts exhibition space in Los Angeles, Hamza was the director of education and associate curator at the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago. In 2017, he co-curated Reconstitution, a group exhibition mounted at LAX Art. In 2016, he co-curated Made in LA's a the, or Made in LA A V Though Only at the Hammer Museum. And in 2015, he curated A Painting is a Painting Isn't a Painting at the Cottest Foundation in San Francisco. Naomi Beckwith, we all know, is the Marilyn and Larry Fields curator here at the MCA. And she's organized numerous exhibitions within these walls. In addition to the incredible exhibition upstairs on Pindell, uh, recent exhibitions include We Are Here, You Are Here, The Freedom Principle, uh, Experiments in Art and Music, 1965 to Now, and an Ascendant Artist Show with the Propeller Group. Before I go, I just wanted to point out two upcoming programs that I think you might enjoy. On Monday the 26th at 6 p.m. in advance of the exhibition Audubon Nakanga to Dig a Hole That Collapses Again, Writer, art historian, and photographer Teju Cole joins us to discuss visibility and social dynamics and to sign copies of his books after the talk. I hope you'll also join us as we open Audubon Nakanga uh, show, and she herself will be joining us on March 31st with an in-gallery performance called Solid Maneuvers at 2 p.m., followed by a talk with the exhibition's curator, Omar Khalif, at 3 p.m. Finally, just a quick note of housekeeping. We love to hear your thoughts on social media with the hashtag MCA Chicago, but we ask you to now silence your phones. So join me in welcoming Hamza and Naomi to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight, and I'm super excited to be in conversation with Hamza, who last time he was here was not executive director Hamza. <laughs> he was a brilliant curator, Hamza. And so I thank you for coming back from LA oh, yeah. um, and losing all that beautiful weather uh, and hanging out with us this evening. Uh, we invited Hamza here today to talk about and around, but mostly around, the Howardina Pendel exhibition. Um, and we chose 1979 to talk about because it's a pivotal point, as January said, in Howardina's life and in her work. Um, but it also seems to be a year where a lot of pressures on what we would maybe call modernism start to push in the art world. And so I thought I'd have uh, Hamza here in conversation with me to think about what some of those pressures are. Um, and most importantly, what the results were. I think for the case of uh, what we think of as contemporary art now. And briefly, for those of you who may or may not, may not have seen the show or may not really understand what happened in 1979, at least around Pendel, I'll just briefly let you know that uh, Pendel uh, had sort of two big seismic events in her life, one of which we'll talk about that year, but that there was a serious protest in the art world that set up the terms uh, that we are still seeing today around representation and censorship. Um, and then secondly, Pendel was in a car accident in 1979, and that changed her work radically, um, where her work went from being purely abstract to more figurative, number one. And then number two, she thought after this life-threatening event that she would uh, include politics and her political activism that 
up until that point had been sort of in the world and outside of her art, she decided to include that in her work. Um, but people kind of treated her like she lost her mind a little bit. Um, and so I want to maybe think about what the terms were for art in 1979, why uh, Howard Dina's uh, audience changed along with work. Her audience and her market, not just the work itself, but really there was a separate reception of her work. Um, so we're going to walk through just a little bit. It looks like you're closer to the... <laughs> to oh, the yeah. slide, so I don't know if you want to be <laughs> the well, slide I mean, man the Howard Dina note. That's um, but uh, here we are with a picture of Howard Dina by our very own Dawu Bay, and I just yeah, kind of walk through that, um, walk through a little bit of her life. But what I think is a fascinating thing about her um, is that she's a figure kind of moving between downtown and uptown, uptown, and so is Dawu. Mm -hmm that year in, in the early uh, late 70s, early 80s in New York. I don't know, do you, would you be able to set up a little bit of context around who and what were active in New York at that time? Oh yeah, c certainly. I mean, you know, the, I think the broader, um, even as a, a run up to 1979, um, to think about uh, the waning of you know a hegemonic modernism as you know born or um, exemplified by abstraction and the kinds of shows that were occurring just in advance of 1979 so it was a very, it was it was a heterogeneous period you know, I would say more than anything, going in, in, into 79 in a sense. I mean, you've got, you know, just as a strange, here are three examples from 1979. I mean, but a, a kind of conceptual art being canonized um, in terms of it, it, all of its key figures had been, the work had been, um, they'd all had solo exhibitions by then, certainly, uh, but by canonization, I would mean more museums acquiring the work by then, by 1979. You know that that wasn't their work had been absorbed. Yeah, that's true, and that's a really interesting point, it, actually, because yeah. I'm thinking about the fact that Howardina worked with Lucy Lepard at MoMA. She worked there for 12 years, but under Lucy, who was one of the folks setting up the terms yeah. of what conceptual practice would be, dematerialization. Yeah, so that would have been one of the one of the strands of a kind of you know, um, it was still active, I would say, as a paradigm in 1979 to a large extent, but but. One that, you know, and certainly as portrayed in the work, it, that paradigm, it had been absorbed, you know, fully. But at the same time, you know, people want to talk about a, a resurgence in figuration. And I don't think that that was necessarily, at least on the American scene, um, I mean, one can make arguments uh, for Europe's, you know, painting in Europe, uh, figuration over the course of the 1970s, um, neo-expressionism. Um, uh, but I would say that that, that abstraction, uh, the power of the New York School, that the return to figuration was m a much rockier road. So if you were to look at key exhibitions from uh, 1977, 78, 79, um, you've got, you know, Marsha Tucker's Bad Painting Show, which is very, very interesting in terms of it as a species of figuration. Um, uh, most of the artists were working outside of New York, doing, doing, you know, doing figures work. But you could almost place that show, you could treat it almost as a species of postmodern irony if you wanted to, in some sense, retrospective. I mean, do you think the show is ironic, oh, yeah. or was the, the painting itself ironic? My sense was the painting. The frame, more yeah, than the, the painting was itself, ironic. Because the yeah. painters objected to being in the show on the grounds that they were doing. It's like, no, 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 my painting isn't bad. Painting at Copley, Joan Brown. Um, uh, John Chaitlin, uh, trying to think of Neil Jenny, right? So there's, it, it had key figures in it, you know, at the time. Um, so that would be one. Another would be Richard Marshall's New Image Painting, 1978, 1979. And, you know, Nicholas Africano, uh, Denise Green, uh, Lois Lane, um, and I'll show some examples. Um, Barbara Rose, Painting the 80s which was in 1979, and it had a title that was supposed to announce trends, you know. But if you look at the, the, the work in terms of how it tried to balance um, 
uh, the reintroduction of figuration. You know, and if you, even if you were to think about a key figure like Ross Blechner, allegory, right? Or even early, you know, um, Julian Schnabel, what is the painting? It's got vampire in the title. Uh, but a fragmented figure in a big red field, you know, so you could really, it's really born out in the work. You know, I would say that it is just this immediate return to figuration. So, you know, right, Lo Louisa Chase, you know, who passed away in 20, 2016, for example, right, this one. And it was interesting, her, her obituary was um, Louisa Chase, painter of body parts and geometric shapes, passes at the I age of 65. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, it's like, thank you, New York Times. I hope you're kinder to me, should I ever be so honored to receive a New York Times obituary? Like, yeah, but curator it's kind of, of body parts <laughs> and geometric forms. But it's kind of tentative. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. The, the, uh, but the Lisa, return of the figure. Lisa Chase, she was a big deal. She was a big deal, you know, in that, that moment, right? Susan Rothenberg, right? Yeah. I mean, and Susan Rothenberg was in, I believe, Barbara Rose's show uh, and Richard Marshall's show. Robert Moskowitz would be another. So it, they, you know, some of them were, were, were crossover figures. Lois Lane, you know, um, and this is, you know, a show. If I were working in a museum, I would, you know, advocate for doing just Lois Lane, 1979, just to bring these paintings back. It's black on black paintings. Like Gary Steffen, Jennifer Bartlett, you know, and uh, Bill Jensen, just just to, as a as a and they were all included in, in, in one or another of those shows, right? So I think Gary Steffen, Jennifer, Jennifer Bartlett was in New Image Painting. Uh, Bill Jensen was in Painting the 80s, Barbara Rose's show. And again, fascinating that you're not getting like a return to any sort of classicism. And sometimes you're not even getting a return to like recognizable forms. So Bill Jensen is like... The crazy biome. Right, yeah, bi right, 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 right. I mean, the kind of rhetoric of classicism is much more, I would say, a European thing, and that's like, it's particularly, you know, Sandro Chia, like an Italian, and that's, um, who's the critic? Uh, 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 God, he did the Aperto shows. He was the main critic for the trans avant-garde who championed Italian neo-expressionism, you know, but he was the one who really applied, and it was there in the work, I would say, between uh, Kia, Clemente, Kuki, you know, as parallels to this work. Mm -hmm. This is all American, I realize. The, that you're this talking stuff, about. Yeah. yeah. But the real um, 1977 Douglas Crimp picture show, that was the one that has the, you know, that would forecast uh, the work that would define the 1980s. But I think it needs to be remembered that when he did this show in 77, that Barbara Rose comes two years later and does, you know, painting the 80s. And that whole argument is played out in in October with Douglas Crimp both, uh, the, I think he, pub he, he, he published a longer essay mm -hmm. for pictures and he did the end of painting, you know, in, in, in October in which he was, you know, naming names. You know, Barbara Rose was the key and it was, I can't remember who Richard, who the painter was who was in Barbara Rose's show, who wrote an essay in art form against photography as an art as late as 1979 or 1980. And then Crimp went after him, you know, and called her, called him Barbara Rose's lap dog, you know, which is like second only to being called a lackey tool, in my opinion. <laughs> but what's interesting too at that moment is what you get is a kind of ascendancy of conceptual tools. So these works, in the most like fundamental way are figurative, but there's a denial yeah. of what the figure is supposed to be. It's the ascendancy of pop mixed with a weird conceptualism, you know? Completely, completely. And this is when the kind of postmodernism kind of shuts everything else down. Well, I think that there's around, um, it's, as far as a, uh, an even longer run up, right, to think of the 1950s as uh, dominated, you know, by a figure like, you know, Clement Greenberg, right, with a critic in the studios, and he's giving, you know, articulation to the arguments around abstract expressionism, right? So then there's a major paradigm shift in the 1960s, and then you have artist writings, 
right, where artists have to take matters into their own hands to talk about work because the critics, it's like, no, 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 no. They don't have the language to deal with this major shift, right? And even a figure like Judd is a critic is really interesting to think about. Both have. is right? another one. Yeah. Adrian right. Piper's writing. So then, you know, I'd say the coming of the 80s, the language that was used, it's the advent of theory, right? That's the, 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 the what, 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 what's the language that we can use to articulate this, n you know, yet another paradigm shift in art. So the rise of October and that whole, whole crew. So I think, you know, assembling a language around the pictures generation and appropriation and those kinds of things is what, what you know, as far as like, um, uh, that would, that would, again, that would just define the period, you know, on outside the artistic front, you know, in terms of the. And that's right. And so theory latches on to this, but there is no theor theorizing, the quote unquote bad painters. Right, right, right. Exactly. But yeah, there's no theorizing, other than I would say, the rhetoric, of allegory is a word that comes into play in the late 70s. And Craig Owens jumps on allegory. You know, then you've got Ross Blechner making certain claims about allegory. It's played out in art form. So, and I think that that has to do, though, with, with another way of turning the figure into, a, obviously, you know, it's allegorical, you know, um, a symbol, yeah. right, that would then allow it to be mobilized within the rhetoric of everything being a text. So here are other examples of just work in strains, Lower East Side, Herring and Basquiat. And this is interesting in terms of Howard Dina with the shift to Free Black in 21. Free right. White oh, Free White in 21. <laughs> free Black in 21 is like growing up with Free that Black in 21 right? was the utopic <laughs> yeah, right, version exactly. that never got made. Growing up with that, like, you know, that's that. Uh, um, to think about uh, the turn to video, to new media, and how there were key figures, uh, even you know Barbara Kruger in terms of like you know graphic design, Dara Birnbaum, where an articulation about not wanting to take up the mantle of painting because that's where patriarchy resides. So the kind of like, it, would you call it an implicit? feminist politics played out in terms of media, like you know, literally in that kind of choice, which I think in terms of Howard Dina being a stalwart modernist in those paintings, then going to video, you know, being played out as a way of But also I think it's a good reminder of the multiple strains of things that are happening at any given time in the art world. So obviously the introduction of a kind of technology allows for a new form to be made, but what you have running alongside, let's say, what um, becomes the dominant our, um, theoretical articulations are things like a painting practice and are things like another kind of sculptural practice, new installation, land art is also like right. born in the 70s. I mean, there are all these strains happening in the art world that, right. and things um, are commonly getting lost. But it's, uh, but, but it's funny, I think about in terms of the historicization, lost and now found by a generation of scholars who, can take a more ob ob you know objective look at the period, you know, and to really make sense about the competing kinds of claims that are made at any given moment. So even things for me, it's like okay, we could talk about the return of figuration within painting, but to say you know Dara Burn about the ish the language of appropriation, and so in terms of a critique of subjectivity, right? It's like could that possibly be played out with on the grounds of painting? Or does it need to have, does, is art parasitic to a media landscape in which we need to critique representation, right? So that feels more, you know, in terms of Birnbaum, like the more immediate and urgent place to locate. If we're going to talk about, you know, subjectivity and identity formation, it's going to be located in billboards, magazines, television, movies, and a critique of that. So it's, it has this like, no, painting, hell no, you know. Though there was that really funny article too in October, of course, um, that was a critique of, of video art, and was it sort of by Rosalind oh, Krauss, yeah, Krauss on Vito Acconci, right? It was oh, all about right. narcissism. Oh my God, so I mean, unless video narcissism. 
video right? the conditions of narcissism exactly totally so unless that. you're looking at the outside world and what you consume then right. you're a complete narcissist uh, but but the application but that's coming from Krauss, right which is totally like so it's like like for and i think it's brilliant for her to suddenly at least acknowledge like wait a minute let me look at this so a kind of formalist but the upshot being it's like her assessment narcissism and i can't and i have to say it's like from her perspective of you know having been like you know you know in a student of Greenberg, like that's what that would have appeared as. So I can't fault it, you know, as a read given if you take her perspective into account. Like, what is this? Put your run around into the front of the camera self business, you know? <laughs> Which, of course, becomes one of the receptions of Free White in 21. Oh, yeah. You yeah, know, right, that, right, right. Just right. Well, just like, like, here it is. Let me just tell you about my stories. Which right? becomes a way of diffusing. Yeah. The, it's sort of political point. You know, it's it's interesting to think about the date. And I'm not, it. for me, the date is actually secondary to, it could have happened in 1978, could have happened in 1977, it could have happened in 1975. And it's interesting that there's like an actual physical traumatic event is where you can locate this shift, right? As opposed to, Howardina is a stalwart m modernist. I mean, I, I, I mean, she is subscribing to minimalism's tenets of, you know, an erasure of subjectivity. Right? There is no history, no memory, and certainly not any autobiography. Right? And that's like you know Michael Asher. You know, as a quote, Judge, like leave that shit at home. You know, and like also, it, <laughs> prior it, to that, she's a good student of Greenberg, and yeah, she right, doesn't yeah, talk about him. But like so much of that early work in the show is an absolute articulation of how does one represent three dimensions on two? How do you make a three-dimensional space without a horizon line, without right. perspective, yeah. without a natural form? How do you give yourself a sense of depth on a flat surface? 100% right. Greenberg. Right. In articulation. And then going into conceptual art, which, in, which you can read as an extension, in some sense, of yeah. that, you know, yeah. logic. So for the reintroduction of the self, like, of course, that's, that's a pretty traumatic, you know. So I would say those kind, that line of thinking is totally borne out and played out in her, you know, in her work in the most literal fashion where it's like, pick up the video camera. You know, uh, this is where this is going to happen. I'm going to give it to you really direct, you know, so. Yeah, so here, and again, 79, just thinking about, and I didn't realize sculpture of the expanded field was 79. I thought it was earlier. Exactly. You, know, you go back and check the dates, you're just like, <laughs> exactly. oh, man. Only now is all this really being given real form yeah. and real theory. Yeah, and here, spaces. Um, I mean, the Studio Museum and what was going on. Um. Exactly. I mean, what I, as I said early in the talk, Howard Dean's an interesting character because she's going between uptown and downtown. She has found a space, a feminist art space downtown. Um, she's living uptown, though. She's also trying to make inroads in um, these other spaces that are set up to be um, for us, by us, for lack of a better phrase, an anachronistic phrase, uh, spaces that are culturally specific, like the Studio Museum, right. where she walks in and says, I'm a black artist, I live in Harlem, I want to show here, and she's told to go back downtown with the white boys because your work looks so sure. much closer to that kind of aesthetic. Um, and so she's trying to navigate these spaces, I think, both as a subject, but also as a, as a painter. And she's making friends with people like Al Loving, they have a very close relationship where oh, they're yeah. thinking about what to do with but painting as textile, and shape. She's, I think, in many ways um, uh, aligned with Jack Whitten, playing with acrylic paint, playing with materials. Um, yep. But the landscape mm -hmm. is still so fragmented. You've right. got, you know, these cats theorizing downtown, but her work doesn't work with that. Um, you've got the cultural specificity uptown, and her work isn't sliding into that quite easily right. either. Right. And the, 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 you know, and it's beautiful. I always cite, I can't remember what year, maybe it was 2010, Dawood's essay. Um, the disappearing black artist, right? Which Al Loving, Melvin Edwards, that that generation of, of of black artists who were engaged with abstraction were immediately eclipsed by 
another generation that then adopts figuration and the rhetoric of multiculturalism, right? Where they were the generation for whom it's like, I don't want to be a black artist. I just want to be an artist, you know? <laughs> so that, that, you know, that turn, they suffered in some sense in terms of, now it's nice to be able to say, okay, Dawood wrote that article in 2010 and how much has changed, right? It's like, okay. Specifically in the market. Are worth, right? It's like Melvin Edwards is up in, you know, um, uh, where is he? No, in Europe. Who who uh, took Gallery? on? Yeah, who took on Melvin Edwards' work? Um, in that's a good question. In Europe, it's um not Zeno X. That was Jack Whitten, right? That's Jack Whitten. Yeah, he went over on Hauser, but it was a uh, 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 oh god, British, French, no, 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 Italian. German, 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 German. Okay. German. <laughs> he chose Don Vo, and uh, he but he's in Berlin and New York. I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. Zwerner. No, 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 not, not Swarner. Like, Julie Ault had the show in New York, um, and when it hits, it'll hit in a second. Okay. It'll, hit in a, it'll hit in a second. But it's just, and he saw Melvin Edwards' work, and I can't remember where, but went gaga over it, and now represents. And there's a lot of that going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, so that generation, in other words, is now having a measure of success, yeah. right? That Dawood was saying there were clips, but now, you know. That now the sun's shining. Now the sun's shining. Yeah. Sun shining. Yes. <laughs> and they're making it rain. <laughs> like, it's like what is that the devil's beating his wife is that the old story like the devil oh, right. yeah right. Like, exactly. when it's raining and there's sunshine and the devil's beating his wife is like, that's what's happening with um, right, black right. <laughs> black abstract artists right now right, exactly <laughs> is the devil beating his wife the sun is shining and it's raining so just other uh, you know artist space right which of course is uh, a, 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 a seminal agent in, in the narrative that we're kind of setting up. ABC do Rio as an alternative space, uh, 1980, uh, uh, AIR gallery. Then this is the gallery, the women's run, yep. women's showing gallery that Howard Dina helped found in 1972. And so this is a kind of landscape, like remember the alternative art space? Exactly. I mean, that's also something really fascinating to think about in terms of how art is developing, especially in New York uh, at this time. Right, and it's more it, the idea of the artist-run spaces that were founded in the 1970s, mid-70s. You know, here, Randolph Street Gallery was amongst them. But they, as far as uh, an alternative to what? An alternative to commercial spaces that could pick up the slack for what at the time were practices video performance that didn't have a commercial right so right so the spectrum of 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 activity that wasn't being allowed within commercial auspices is what those spaces or museums I or too, museums. in those earlier days too but, so. in say, but in some sense as you look at the history of the mca and even la mocha in a way in terms of they were actually i mean in terms of progressive they were it, i i would say that there was a kind of funny parallel that they were quite aware of wanting to do things of what that full spectrum was so when you look at things that were going on in the mca from, you know it's founding you know up to the 70s it's like Oh wow, they were doing this performance. It was they were progressive. They were the progressive into things. Absolutely. Those were the opening salvos of this museum, which I think is also a very good point that you just brought out too, that these were museums of contemporary art. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. like yeah. now you also have a full kind of um uh naming and articulation of the contemporary. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, this is starting to happen in the sixties. Right. As opposed to abstract expression in the painting and the and the, the modern, modern arts, the way. moments right, of the right, world. Right. Exactly. So, Right, it's really that's really really great to think about the museums themselves as the the contemporary in the names of those institutions. Right, there's a break exactly. there, but then I would say that with alternative spaces, there's yet another break. Mm. Right, so they're found in the 1970s, but in terms of their footing, in another way, the 1980s is where they find another kind of bearing. That's right? interesting. So it isn't point, simply yeah. that they are alternatives to commercial spaces, but you know, the shift to the Reagan years and a disavowal of the 1960s, I would say, gave those spaces another kind of raison d'etre, right, in terms of fight the power, right, if you're gonna define the 1980s as a wholesale dismantling of the 1960s, right? It was like, wait a minute, like, what, who, the, what was the trajectory of the civil rights movement? You know, those kinds of questions, right? So these spaces, and Exit Art is 1982, 
you know, and then group material, which is founded, this is the earliest, at least, you know, black and white, you know, old school documentation, even though they were founded in 1972. 1982 is the year, 19, they were founded in 19, 1979, sorry, 1979, it's group material. 1882 is when they give up their space. And that's when they resort to doing billboards, just public, right, magazine inserts, curatorial activities in a number of the alternative spaces around town. So as far as an ethos or milieu about the formation of, uh, um, you know, I don't know the extent to which the term, and I hate the term, political art, um, but I think it is a term of convenience that found it, that got put into circulation over the course of the 1980s. Right, where um, a kind of it, be, it, it, it was shorthand for work that was an immediate response to that context, yeah, yeah. you know, essentially in terms of the naming of names, yeah. you know, what time is it? You know, so, but I, but I think of that as really important to as a as a kind of groundwork for Howard De Howardina's, you know, um, get woke, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's in. And taking on, you know, where did the rhetoric of diversity and multiculturalism and a kind of activism, um, how did it, how did it, you know, percolate up and through these spaces, so that then um, a kind of uh, model, however nascent it may have been, for things like the Black Cultural Emergency Action Group, you know, to form. And I would say feminism would be really important for that. So exactly. And so here we land on a key event from '79. Key event for at least Howardina from 1979. So the artist space, the space that showed the British left and was ostensibly progressive, had a lot of public funding um, when such things existed, put on a show called the Nigger Drawings, and it was a show, uh, a solo show. Was it Donald Newman? Yeah, yeah by Donald Newman. Newman. Yeah, we forgot his uh, name. Who took the Newman off his name, and used to refer to himself as the Donald. Oh, the Donald, that's right. The Donald. Uh, the, 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 was the, the? I'm not making this up. Did he, he say the? The Donald. He referred to himself as the? In third person. I knew that he, I forgot yeah. the fact that he removed his last name. Right. I that, but I, the, Donald. holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, this became a flashpoint for the art world, obviously. Um, I mean, uh, maybe not obvious. It wasn't obvious to some people that this should have been a problem. Um, so Artist Space puts it up. Uh, a few sort of ad hoc committees uh, and ad hoc actions came up in response to this show, and there were multiple ways in which they wanted to address this. One was just about the language itself. The second was, uh, which was, you know, a, a, a free speech issue. And many uh -huh. people oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Um, but then there was the question of funding. Uh, should an organization that uses language like this get public funding, uh, especially from black taxpayers? Um, I should point out that the Donald is or was not black. I don't know if he's still alive, actually. And then there was nothing in the subject of the works, which were mostly sort of charcoal drawings and or photostat, um, and or photostat uh, reproductions. There was nothing about race there. Not that that would make this better, but there was nothing in relationship to the title. I mean, to the, yeah, exactly, to the title in the works themselves. And then lastly, there was a question of uh, what became a sort of internecine Art World War, and I think uh, some of that shows up on the next slide. So you get like the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition coming mostly from uptown, downtown, staging protests. But you get a lot of quote unquote woke folks in the oh, art yeah. world um, also s putting pressure on that on the institution, asking them to at least explain themselves. And this really does become a huge. Uh, conflict within the art world. It's right. an uptown versus downtown thing. In some cases, it's a white versus black thing. Um, it plays out in the pages of October where most of the editorial board can't understand why people would assume the word nigger would be insulting. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, right. It's right there. I mean, you you know, it's mentioning earlier, it's Douglas Crimp. It's, it's Craig, yeah, Owens Craig Owens actually Owens. coming to yeah. the defense of the show, which is almost, it's not even almost, it's unthinkable now. But to go back and to realize, like, wow, these were the avatars of a kind of postmodern irony, exactly. in a sense, right? Making it kind of, um, uh, and as though there were an implicit kind of critique going on there 
which didn't exist in any kind, the, the space didn't come, yeah. you know, it wasn't born out anywhere. Nobody was saying anything. It was just implicit critique, <laughs> the air you breathe, yeah. as though implicit critique was self-evident. Right. No. Well, also there's like this sort of um, perpetual attempt to denature language that happens in these sort of theoretical models. And not to say it wasn't useful, but it's really fascinating that there's a sense you can never take language at its word, no pun intended. Right. Um, but I'm more fascinated by the fact that these kind of modes of critique and this mode of postmodern irony comes through race, right, as its own kind of provocation. Mm -hmm. Like if you really want to push a button, if you really want to get to the slipperiness of things, then race is the, where you but, land. But, but, but that it, the fact that it is being, and this happens again, and I had one of the most intense tete-a-tetes, and it was quite beautiful. I did a little talk on Jason Rhodes at Hauser and Veer. And, hey, and Jason Rhodes and is Jason Rhodes famous, for lack of a better Pussy. word, for making a yep. giant installation hey, called Black, Black Pussy. Pussy. Scatter artwork. Right. And it was really, it was me and Bennett, Bennett Simpson. And Paul McCarthy and Jason was one of, you know, Paul, was Paul's students. I want to see most proud of. Paul was front row center. And afterwards, Paul McCarthy and I, you know, got a little bit of liquor in us. And we're talking, and it was, he was saying, you know, well, the preservation of artistic freedom has to be maintained at all costs. And it was just like, okay, but the idea that who, what is the profile of that freedom? It's like oh, a white male, like who's doing, or like who's gonna go off and use race as the crux to prove that he is free to do whatever it is that he wants, right? <laughs> and all the thing, it was on the like, back of, <laughs> right? Or on the back of, right? This is, you know, well, you know. So that was a so, so the, the 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 continued existence of that right so but I think that that is precisely what was going on then, exactly. right? That this was about and so with with Owens and Kremp championing and saying no no art is a space of criticality and which is freedom so it's a, it's all, all tied to that freedom was but at the same time it was like no 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 that is. Um, uh, it, what, what the, I, I don't want to say like the province of the, the critique or it's like it's like usurpation or it being kind of in advance of in advance it overshadowing the work of other artists in a way so to think about the 90s right and the issue of a critique of stereotypes so it's almost like this exhibition happens in advance of latter-day 80s and early 90s artists where the issue of blackface, mm -hmm. right? And how the parallels between the arguments here, <laughs> right, in advance of work that has yet to be 10 years later, that then it's like, okay, let's take on the stereotype. Let's actually try and take this, which in, or, you know, involved black artists mm -hmm. at the time, I would say, culminating in Kara and Carrie Jane Hank Marshall. Willis Thomas. Yeah, right. And so it's like, it's, it's a, um, so the results being wholly different, Absolutely. right? And so. And the critique being elsewhere as well. Before we jump to Kara in one second, I want to go back for one second too and just, uh, just add a little biographical note for Howardina. So Howardina at this point in 1979 is still working at a cura as a curator at MoMA. Um, and she, falls on the side of those who at least want to take or call the artist space to task for the title of the show or even, you know, showing this man in the first place. Um, and she gets caught up in this kind of to and fro around the space of freedom and the preservation thereof versus what um, others call censorship. So essentially she was considered an agent of censorship in, at MoMA and it became so untenable for her there as an artist protesting another artist, she left. So this really changes her career. I mean, she oh, yeah, really, oh, yeah. she leaves the curatorial world at this moment because she can't even have a productive conversation around these two terms that I st think are still playing out, mm -hmm. sadly, 40 years later. Right, but, yeah, yeah, but I think, you know, and this is where a real, you know, genuflect to Howardina saying, that she took a hit, yeah. you know, in a, in, a, in a space and at a time when, 
you know, kind of um, suppleness of argument, but to really say, you know, it's untenable at MoMA, you know, she's black, she's there, there's nobody else around, and the terms, they don't, the institution, which was so proud in hiring Darby as a consultant. You remember, <laughs> like in terms of being like, we don't have any black curators, and it's like, <laughs> I cannot believe that this can, in the New York Times, it's like, there's no reflection, there's no man It's like, oh, we'll get around to it, you know, and like, you know, and, but it's, it's, so it's still, it's an extension of the story, exactly. right? And I think about Howard Dean at that time, but there's no, well, who was she, who was there to change, you know, she's there, <laughs> and there's nobody else. You know, and it, it was an untenable situation to try and say there's no rhetoric or language, like or institutional sensitivity. Like, was the work even in the collection? You know, to even begin to have this kind of dialogue, let alone one that would side with her position or point of view, right? Which I believe, in some sense, would be the case now, right? To think about like that not being the case at all then, you know, so. Absolutely, and as I said earlier, then her work radically changes from here. So here's a woman who is rather politically active on the street, in the world, but not in the studio. She has the kind of post-minimalist erasure going on in the studio. From this point on, she realizes that then her work um, and the art world itself um, is a great platform for a kind of political activity. Um, I should also say, she starts writing too. That time? Yeah, I mean, she was writing a little bit about her work before, up until this point, but then by 79, she's starting to do a series of essays and studies um, called Art World Racism. Um, right, right, and right. And she continues That's to right. do these kind of demographic right. studies of the art world from here on exactly, out, from the studies, right. looking at um, the number of women and the number of artists of color who are shown in museums and galleries. Right, so she really does lay the groundwork for counting. Yeah. Keeping count and keeping track, in which case it becomes you know, memory. Somebody's got to start somewhere with asking the question is like, has it gotten better? Ain't a damn thing changed. <laughs> but now we can prove it. You know? <laughs> and now we can prove it. <laughs> but, but then we come to Kara, and I right. wanted to come to Kara. We make a jump of what? Twi uh, 30 years? Yeah. 20 years, sorry, I can't count. Yeah. Um, 20 years. Uh, because as I say, if 79 is the year that Howard Dina becomes woke, then by the late 90s, you see the product of this kind of political instinct that she's, uh, that she's developed starting yeah, in the late right, 70s. Right, right, but it's, it's, it's you know, and it's, it's great being invited to do this because this is one of my, I mean, I'd known you know, Howard Dina Pendel's work, but having been, you know, involved with the exhibition of, you know, Kara's work in 1997, and this is just on the eve, right after this, she gets to MacArthur. And that's what triggers Betty Saar and Howard Dina having the whole petition. You might want to spell it out for people, actually, oh, for those okay, of you who yeah. don't she know. Gets, yeah. Kara gets, uh, gets a MacArthur Award in 90, 90, 90, it, is, it is 97, and it triggers uh, Betty Saar and Howard Dina Pendel take up a, they actually just do a petition and start asking uh, uh, artists and curators, I mean, in similar fashion to the Donald show at Artist Space, to, uh, to sign on in protest of the exhibition and collecting of Kara Walker's work. And a real, you know, um, and this, uh, in terms of, you know, I remember Martin Purrier getting the petition <laughs> and wondering and saying, should I sign this? And eventually saying, no, he didn't sign. He didn't <laughs> sign. You know, um, uh, Richard Serra asking, you know, it was very, very funny. I, you know, I, looked at, I had a conversation with him about Kara's work in 97, 98, you know, and he, and he looked, he looked, he said, you know, he got a copy of that first, the Renaissance Society catalog, and he went through it page by page, and, and it was great. Richard Sarah looked at it and goes, 
this is really powerful stuff. Like, <laughs> you know, like, you know. And so the issue of the petition, so then, but that question about artistic freedom, right, to then say, it's like, all right, well now here we have a model of, you know, a wild child, just gotta get out there. But the generational divide between Kara and Howard Dean. So in some sense, now I have to respect that petition when I think about it coming out of their positions in 1979, which I was unable to do in 1997. Of course you know, I was virulently yeah. against their petitioning because my sympathies were with Kara because we're the same generation. And they say, this is a post-civil rights, a post-roots thing. You got to understand. And they're like, no, we don't. No, we don't. We want more dignified images of blacks. Yeah. But to then, you know, the deeper questions that go on in Kara's work, you know, in terms of what's at stake, right? Um, uh, I think of it as the site of a kind of humanism, you know, where the work would go. But those objections, and again, the context for those objections having some legs to it. Absolutely, because I think if you look at a title of Kara's work, and this isn't probably the best case scenario, but, you know, if you see the word nigger, which does show up in some of her titles, I could see how you're triggered to go back to the Donald. Don, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And how you can look at a certain type of provocation as critique right. from a moment in the late 70s and see that reiterated even right. in the work of the late 90s. Right, but by then, by, by I mean, it, by the mid 90s, I mean, you know, in terms of looking at um, a that series of painters who was betwixt and between in terms of abstraction, right? To then look at Kara's work and be like, no, 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 no. There's no betwixt and between here. It's full on figurative. There's no doubt. Like, and no. narrative. Yeah, and narrative. That Which I think is something that was missing from some of those earlier even figurative exactly. works. Exactly. There's no there. You know, there's no vestiges. You know, of a modernism here. It's gone. And now. So as far as like a subject position being articulated, you know, in figurative work, black and white, you know, really direct terms, um, that that's the that's its strength. You know, there was no, um, it's not equivocating. You know, not in the not, least. It's not bit. beholden to, you know, that kind of older paradigm in a way. But should we go to questions at this point? I don't yeah, know. We might want to go to questions at this point. Now that we've landed at the at the very end. And we keep going. But yeah, oh, 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 until next Tuesday. Um, if you have a question, we ask that you just wait till someone brings you a microphone so everyone can hear your question. Feel free to raise your hand as the lights are coming up. There's a question down here. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I noticed that one of the pictures that belongs to the Museum of Contemporary Art was donated, I think, in 1978 by Name Gallery, or 70. It was like the same year. Did she show here in Chicago? Howard Dina? Yeah, so that So time. that work is a work that came into the collection as part of a, a, a portfolio series. So it was one of many things, which was really interesting, and some people have made jokes about that <laughs> as well, that Howard Dina's first work in the MCA collection actually had to come through. Um, hey, with the group, yeah, in the tail and other things. So, um, but to a longer answer to your question is that she did start showing in Chicago in the 80s through the Namde Gallery. And I think what's another fascinating aspect around this kind of reception of Howard Dina's work is that by, by the time her work switches between the 70s and 80s, her audience switches, her market turns over completely um, so that you get more of a black collector base after 1979, so that a lot of people who aren't black didn't know that she was showing here um, in the 70s, uh, sorry, in the 80s and then in the 90s. Uh, so what was that, and that piece came in in 19, it was acquired in 78? That's a good question, I have to look at the acquisition date. Yeah. It was definitely made. So then okay. that would be that's, 78. That's, right. that's what I was asking. It is acquired. But the short answer is that's an addition work that came in a portfolio. Mm -hmm. We're all just stunned in silence. I know. Did I turn on the question thing too fast? No. Yeah. But it was funny. I was in terms of even that 
you know, I could talk more about the conversation with Paul McCarthy about artistic freedom. Hi. Hi <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, so uh, I was wondering if you could reflect on today's um, situation with representation and maybe how Ardina, um, she's a teacher and she's very influential. And I was wondering if you could talk about maybe her situation as a, or her position as a, as an educator, a future artist, and her impact now, and kind of the rep, the repercussions of, of her work and her her positions on other artists. If you've seen that continuing, either of you, thanks. And are we talking about sorry, just the work itself, the objects, or are we also talking about a kind of political position? Okay. Um, so what's fascinating to me about Howard Dina is that, um, in terms of like the babies that come from her work. Um, I see mostly a formal, a formal kind of uh, thing play out. And one of them um, is when you talk to a lot of artists who you wouldn't necessarily think of in terms of Howard Dina, there's a lot of I love Howard Dina. And I'm thinking of younger black artists, Mark Bradford, Rushi Johnson, uh, Micheline Thomas, they love her, love her. And I think uh, for them, they, she's allowed for a couple of things. One is this kind of negotiation of the figure. Um, another is a play between painting and sculpture that's so important for them. And I think particularly in the case of Mark Bradford, this use of distressing paper over and over again to kind of move between something that's legible and illegible. Um, I don't know what really happens in her classroom in terms of a kind of politic, but I'd wager to say that she's someone who I think on the surface believes in a form of artistic freedom. Like she believes that a student should be allowed to explore a certain extent. But what I'm fascinated by um, is uh, the sense of a limit on freedom. Um, in the case of this petition, that started with her and Saar, one of the main sticking points of that petition was this idea that it is their responsibility as women of color to make good representations of people of color. Um, and they couldn't understand why someone like Kara could make this kind of image that uh, was what they felt was denigrating um, and deleterious to black people. Um, not thinking about the sort of fantasy element in there, but in their mind, this was a, made for a kind of white consumption that it fed into what was already a kind of prefigured uh, notion of what blackness was. And so there's a sense of responsibility for the SARS and Pendels of the world. And so there may be a kind of nod to freedom, but again, these gifts are supposed to be moved in a certain direction. I should just say on May 17th, Naomi is also leading another panel about Howard Dina that uh, will specifically address her practice between these different fields of curatorial practice and teaching practice and art practice. So that'll be something to look forward to, to really dive into that. Good evening. I'm interested in um, the concept of uptown and downtown and this kind of binary of black and white um, in regards to the inclusion of the figure um, and the kind of exiling of black artists who were non-figurative and non-representational. And why, as I think you mentioned, Naomi, that her work became more collectible by a lot of African-American collectors once she started to insert the figure. Um, and why those two aesthetics, when you looked at someone like um, Hammonds and um, even someone such as Barclay Hendricks, who's ex exclusively working with the figure. Um, if you can kind of tease out for us a little bit of that difference and why um, that figurative representation was important. Shall I start? You wanna? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the uptown, uptown, downtown being played out on the terms of figuration versus abstraction, I mean, key, um, intermediaries, right, like a Norman Lewis, you know, where I think uh, he and the subsequent role that he would play over the course of the 1960s in terms of direct political activism, right? So it's not, so the picture that we have of some of these artists, there's the work, right? Then there's them, then there's who they knew, right? And then there's the grainy black and white photograph of Norman Lewis with the bullhorn protesting Harlem on my mind. Or Norman Lewis siding with, you know, 
like trying to get a coalition, you know, black labor, right, and labor struggles as an issue, right? So I think of that as the full, and now that's, you know, it's quite beautiful in a sense to have a kind of historical hindsight that takes a figure like, I can't separate out Norman Lewis's work from the person as a whole now, right? As opposed to at that time, how did those, how did they balance all the stuff that seemed contradictory, <laughs> right? And so on the one hand, I think that they, you know, artists wanted to maintain an integrity to the, the, the principles of abstraction, right? Um, but they didn't, that that did not, uh, uh, and if that did displace another kind of uh, agency, then so be it, you know, to another realm of direct action. Um, uh, and, and, I th and I do think of that as, um, again, in historical hindsight, part of the strength of the work, right? It wasn't, you know, it's dialectical. You know, and it's not, and I can't, if I can't necessarily locate a dialectical tension within the work itself, then I might have to resort to the biography, you know, of the artist to say, oh, no, 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 no. This isn't just a question of, I'm not just going to look at these pretty shapes and colors and forms. There is that, <laughs> right? But there's a lot more going on here at play that then becomes, in terms of being taken into account, in terms of the valuation of the work, that then becomes what makes that work important. Right, and that those considerations are not excluded from the work, in which case the work is then devalued. You know, it's just being purely formalist work. Right, so I don't know if that addresses the question about for a historical figure like a Norman Lewis. In another sense, if I were to kick it up to today, the whole bevy of young black figurative painters, it's almost like, I don't know what I did. I, I like. I turned around for one second, and then I turned back around. It's like, huh, where'd you come from? It's like, it's a, it's, was there a switch at Yale that just went on, and suddenly all these, like, right? And who was the ringleader? Candy. <laughs> like, you know, like, Gary, who was responsible? You know, and which, um, uh, you know, it's in terms of the, the, the swing of a pendulum in a bigger sense, right? And to think about how Radina and her importance as being somebody who's right in the middle of that swing. You know, so now I feel like now we're in the, you know, in the other side of this arc with all this figurative work, right? But I think, you know, whether or not you, how you might feel about, you know, how Radina's work pre-79 versus post-79, the work is important just because these kinds of debates, that's where they're being played out. You can watch that narrative up, up, upstairs, you know, for better or for worse. You know, there's no, and I don't think there's anywhere else to go other than that work. You know, yeah, we can I have mean, this conversation funny. in a theoretical sense, but who, what are the, who are the artists that we're talking about? You know, so to look at a figure like Al Loving, where, you know, I don't know, he stated, you know, a level of abstraction, uh, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the reason why doing the show was so fascinating for me, because, of course, I mean, Howard Dean's work itself is incredible, but the variation within it is telling, mm -hmm. right? And those kind of variations you can see, as you say, these kind of debates working out in the art world. I think there's also something a little bit more subtle happening, too. I think a lot of it has to do with Howard Dean's own activities, where in a lot of her political activity, though she's working um, against all these kind of prejudices that she sees, her loudest voice is as a feminist. So I think some of that resistance that's happening uptown at the Studio Museum is also the fact that, like, where have you been? Like, we didn't see you protesting Harlem on my mind. And we didn't see you protesting the um, Black Artists in America show. In fact, she was in the Black Artists in America show, and she refused to pull her work. She was like, hey, look, this is a real opportunity. <laughs> I'm taking it, right? And the work that sh it was shown at the Whitney is upstairs right now. Um, and so she was also savvy about career stuff. I mean, she did not, obviously, care for racism, but I think there was also a sense that no one understood what, what side she was on fully. I mean, and to go back to this question too of like, um, of figuration being a little bit more palatable, figuration being an uptown thing, um, even that was a little bit of a belated, belated reception. So if I think about someone like uh, Barkley Hendricks, I mean, his first show at the Studio Museum was deep in the 80s or 90s. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not talking about him getting 
a big audience in the 70s either. Student Museum is still committed to a lot of uh, weird kind of post-fluxus work uh, throughout the 70s. So it wasn't totally the case even that somehow um, Howard Dina's work was that much of an outlier. I think there was also a case of who, who's aligning themselves with whom. We have time for one more. It's really, really nice how the, you know, thinking about even if the reception and the the canonization of a figure, you know, of Howard Dina in a way, or of Barclay Hendricks, and just how it's now, you know, I mean, we might be having this discussion along the lines of, of race, but I just feel like it's like, no, 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 just as soon as you have, it's like, you, you know, you can get like this, or you can get like that, right? And, 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 but it's, it's, you know, I make the joke about Kerry James Marshall and William Pope L being born in the same year, right? <laughs> like, or like when you think about that, you're like, oh my God, those are two totally different artists and emerges. Or think about like, it's like Barking Howard, it's like, oh no, this is great. This is, these are the terms on which, like, you know, what does a black art look like? Or exactly. it having to be figured. It was like, no, it doesn't have to be figured. Right. It can be whatever it is you want. He's like, you can, mm -hmm. you know. But I think that the the terms on which it would be eroded would be, you know, a consideration of, you know, Hendrix and, you know, Howard Dina, like, together only to then, like, break a, a stereotypical notion about what, you know, a black artist can be or ought to do. You know, exactly. and now is the time that their work is being appraised to make that possible. Totally, you know? totally. So it's th that work is now, you know, in a way. Hi. <laughs> um, I guess your last statement sort of um, touched upon the question that I was preparing for that I really had to do about the gender dynamics and sort of Howard Dina's commitment to fe feminism and how that played out in this sort of uptown, downtown t dynamic. And I guess I just wanted to ask you to say a little bit more about that, because I think, like, you started to talk about the ways in which, like, at the Studio Museum, like, those very early shows, like, I think there's, like, Sam Gilliam and Melvin Edwards and William T. Williams and Tom Lloyd, like, all these people are showing that are abstraction, but they're all men. <laughs> um, and so I guess my question was just about if you would say just a little bit more about how you think the kind of gender dynamics and her kind of commitment to fe feminism might be also playing out um, in that conversation that's happening with black artists uptown. Well, you just laid out the base work for that, so thank you, Janet. Um, <laughs> but what I would layer onto that is um, Howardina's particular refer a return to the figure. So whereas Barclay is doing these really wonderful uh, art historically based obvious images of other folks, um, Howardina's return to figuration is all about her subjectivity. Um, again, the right, quote unquote aesthetics point. of narcissism, yep. if you will. Yep. Yep. And her return right. to figuration also isn't through a form of academic expertise. Right. So what you get with a lot of these others, other folks, men, um, working with the figure is academia. What you get with Howardina is a kind of um, uh, embodiment onto the canvas. Those works upstairs, she's not drawing the body. She's laying down on a canvas and then tracing her own figure. And she's making this kind of memento of her body and putting her presence literally onto the canvas. Um, when she is doing this academic thing, it's mainly the face and that's about it. But I don't think she's really interested in the kind of practice of painting and showing a heroism as part of a painting practice. She's really interested in the kind of um, instantiation of herself onto the canvas as subject and as object. So that's a different kind of figuration altogether and one that I think is wholly, wholly uh, a feminist enterprise. It's one that she talks about quite clearly as being um, inspired by Anna Mendieta. Um, one where she's thinking about uh, the eccentric abstraction that Lucy Lepard lays out, and one that comes from working with materials like through the body and through the hand. Um, she talks about Eva Hesse as being a big, um, a big, um, how do you call it, uh, influence in that way. She's friends with Faith Ringgold, and they are also tearing up canvases and cutting it out, much in the same way that Howardina does it early on in a square fashion, but later on, this cutting the figure out and putting it back in is still a kind of quilting practice. So there are all these ways in which she is a woman is thinking of the figure in another way, literally trying to remove that heroic hand and trying to get away from academia, very specifically. And then there's also the sense of her protest um, 
her protest happens with other women because I'm sure she felt safe with those other women. She went to Yale at a time when it was not co-ed. Um, and you have to remember, yeah, the grad school was co-ed, um, but the program wasn't 50-50 or 60-40 as it is now, women to men. Um, and there are, no men, men, uh, there are no women undergrads, so she's in an incredibly male-dominated space. There are no other black women at Yale at that time, period. Um, so she finds women to be her comfort. That is her group. Now, all sorts of problems arise with that that play out in the video Free White in 21. So while she's trying to protest um, against racism and definitely against sexism, it's really the boys who are getting together, though, um, and doing all these conferences inside the museum. There are no women speaking at Black Artists Now at Met. Or, or the uh, Black Artists in the Mainstream. Exactly. Right? Black, that was all men. All boys, the black all boys, all boys. And so, you know, but it's, it's, it's interesting to think of you know, you drawing all the parallels of her affiliations and very conscious acknowledgments of, you know, her, her, her peers, you know, at that time. You know, but what I think is great about the question is, is to what extent would that, you know, would there have been any kind of hierarchy between, it's like, you know, race, gender, and, and but then to say, okay, could you, you know, knowing that uh, something like, black artists in the mainstream were all black men, <laughs> right? So then I have to say, would you, would you, you know, to be pointed, would it, you know, from a feminist position, even a black feminist position, to look at that, <laughs> right, as an example of yet, you know, a nested kind of patriarchy, right, that you have to attack. It's like, let's go for at home, you know, you know, as, a, as a thing, and I don't know if that was ever consciously like addressed by Howardina. No, and I don't think a lot of black women have come to address that either. Yeah. You right. know, I'm not saying that she was rejected wholesale by the black community. It was, you know, the male director of the museum, at the studio museum at that time. Yeah. Not, but she, again, her and Faith and, and all these other women living downtown, black women living downtown, they're still friends. And Betty Sauer, obviously, who becomes a running buddy <laughs> against, against uh, Kara Walker. But it's funny, when I take away the art side of things and think about black women addressing um, patriarchy within the civil rights movement, right, that that's articulated quite clearly, right, where, where wait a minute, this has to be, you know, we're actually going to have a, 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 a fight right here on the immediate home front in order to kind of like level this playing field and situation right here, right now, you know, so it's part of like, a liberation struggle, you know, like what, what, um, uh, who, uh, uh, you know, enemies near <laughs> and far, <laughs> despite the fact that we're all working under mm -hmm. the auspices of liberation here, right? So, but it has certain priorities, it has certain priorities, right? Right, right. But to wonder the extent to which within the arts and how little acknowledge that position is, but like you're saying, I think in Free White in 21. It's all there, but it just doesn't assume an order when it, com when it comes out, you know? And that's not to say that it, co it, it couldn't, you know? No, but I would say her work after 79 is, is exactly that. It refuses a kind of order, mm -hmm. which I'm just gonna be utopian and say that's a feminist gesture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Before we go tonight, I neglected one very, very important thing in my introduction, which I just wanted to say to you all, which is that tonight's uh, conversation, which has been so wonderful, is supported, uh, it's part of a Anche, J, Anche B and John J. Jelinek Endowed Lecture Series that is made possible through a generous gift to the Chicago Contemporary Campaign. And we always want to make sure that we mention the people who make these kinds of wonderful conversations possible. So thank you to them. And thank you, Naomi and Hamza, for being here. Thank you, January.